to this lecture on human rights, a basic overview of human rights. I'm Dale Snoward, Professor of Peace Studies at the University of Toledo. The purpose of this lecture is to outline and discuss the basic idea and, and of and the basic elements of, a, of human rights. As we've discussed before, the sphere of peace can be understood as a balanced structure of state-society power relations, which creates a corridor of liberty, justice, and peace. It is this corridor that constitutes the space where peace and justice are pursued. The main point of identifying the sphere of peace as a balanced structure of state, society, power relations is to point to the understand, understanding that the political participation of engaged and informed citizens is necessary for this pursuit. It is the moral and political power of the people that is necessary for the establishment, enactment, and maintenance of justice and peace. As we will discuss, human rights are an important tool for the empowerment of citizens in relation to the power of the state. Furthermore, positive peace can be understood as the realization of the complete range of human rights. Peace can be defined in accordance with Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a just society that realizes and protects human, right, human rights. The idea of human rights is the dominant way of articulating the demands of justice in the modern world. It has become, rights talk has become the lingua franca of global moral thought. The language of rights and duties constitutes the principles of human dignity, an ethic of human dignity thereby consist being consistent with the moral point of view, that is, the criteria of fairness and our basic moral convictions of equality and respect for persons. We can turn to the definition of human rights. What defines the idea of human rights? There are a number of compatible, logically consistent ways of conceiving what constitutes a right, all of which follow from the basic ideal of human dignity. If every human being possesses an equal inherent worth, then what is the human being due, justified in demanding, entitled to, or protected from? One way to conceive rights, therefore, is to define them as what a human being is due. From this perspective, rights constitute what each and every human being is owed by virtue of their humanity. Rights, uh, from this perspective, are justified demands for the socially guaranteed enjoyment of ethical goods. Uh, furthermore, some rights are basic in the sense that are necessary for the enjoyment of all other rights. A right, therefore, is a rational basis for a justified demand in the sense that it provides compelling reasons for the demand being met. Rights have to have to do with Rights have to do with the irrational basis of justified demands for the uh, enjoyment of goods fundamentally necessary uh, for, their, for the realization of a good life. They, rights can also be conceived as protections against coercion, deprivation, and human treatment. So in addition to justified demands or claims, uh, human rights can also be defined as protections. Turning to the foundation of rights, 
what is generally accepted as the foundation is the inherent dignity, equal dignity of each human person. The human rights find their grounding in equal dignity. And this is expressed in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Therefore, uh, our Article 1 uh, suggests a plurality of foundations all linked to human dignity, that uh, free and equal personhood, equal dignity, uh, they are, uh, have an equal endowment of reason and conscience. They exist in a spirit of brotherhood, equal brotherhood, and human beings have equal human agency or are entitled to equal human agency. As discussed in the, in our as we discussed before on moral reasoning and the moral point of view, the normative assertion of equal intrinsic value and dignity is a basic moral conviction which is in reflective equilibrium with the principle of human rights as justified demands, claims, and protections. From within the moral point of view, the legitimacy of human rights finds its rational basis in the moral conviction of human dignity. Given their basis in human dignity, human rights are universal in the sense that they are the possession of every human being, not on the basis of merit as such, but by their very existence. If rights are to be human rights in any meaningful scope, sense, their scope must be universal in this sense. We turn to the content of human rights. In uh, when we consider ethical judgment, we find that there are two basic elements of ethical ju judgment, the good and the right. And the content of human rights refers to the ethical goods that we have reason to value. These goods are so important that if denied, the realization of one's potential is impeded. In that sense, every human being has a justified claim, a right to them. Generally, there are three broad categories of the content of human rights. Negative liberty, positive liberty, and social and economic rights. This conception of the content of rights as negative and positive is fundamental to modern political, legal, and moral theory. Negative liberty refers to the absence or the or freedom from coercive interference. Implicit in this conception is an area within each person can act unobstructed by others. That is, uh, negative liberty creates a zone of privacy, immune from coercive interference a zone wherein one is free to act as long as one does not cause harm to others. A right to negative liberty guarantees the right to conceive and pursue one's own conception of the good and the good life. Human rights to negative liberty protect individuals from coercive interference. Rights to negative liberty in include, for example, freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought and speech, freedom of association, uh, a right to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development, to freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources without prejudice, 
It entails a right to life, a right not to be sub subjected to torture or cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment, a right to security of person, a right to presumed innocence and due process in legal proceedings. It also entails equality before the law, before the courts and other tribunals, not subject, and it includes the right not to be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference. Positive liberty refers to freedom to rather than freedom from coercion. It's, it's a right to freedom to determine one's own destiny, which we can call or refer to as self-determination. Self-determination is the core concept of positive rights, and these rights entail a justified demand for equal civic and political participation. There is a fundamental interdependence between self-determination and a right to political participation. It is a right to a justified claim, a demand to participate equally in the social, civic, and political life of one's society. It also entails a basic right to justification as as developed by the philosopher Reiner Forst. Justice is based upon the principle and right of justification, the idea that equal intrinsic human dignity of each person provides the foundation of a basic right to receive justification and a correlative duty to offer justification to others as a fundamental matter of respect. As free and equal citizens, each citizen has a ba basic right to ask for reasons of justification and to question those reasons. Citizens have a right not to be subjected to norms and practices that, reasonably pr that reasonable persons would have grounds to reject. This right provides a moral ground for contrast consensual power, which in turn provides a rational basis for the legitimacy of a democratic structure and distribution of power. Rights to positive liberty include moral and political justification, political liberties, equal suffrage and enfranchisement, the right to serve on juries, the right to, f to freely dissent, the right to petition the government uh, to protest against government policy, etc. The third category of rights is are referred to social and economic rights, and this centers on a basic right of subsistence a basic right to uh, economic goods necessary for uh, any semblance of a decent life. And social and economic rights refer to the idea of the fair value of liberty. Unless, uh, unless there are substantive social opportunities for the exercise of liberty, it is not real. Liberty or freedom requires not merely constraint, but actual social resources <clears throat> and opportunities for the exercise of freedom. One is not capable of pursuing what one has reason to value without the substantive social opportunity to exercise one's freedom. Freedom is substantive in this sense. Its fair value needs to be guaranteed. This idea of the fair value of liberty leads to the specification of further rights, such as a right to work, a right to unionize, a right to collectively bargain, 
a right to counter extractive liberty, free, which is the freedom from economic exploitation, a right to safe working conditions, a right to ed education, and a right to health care, etc. These rights are listed here, some examples of social and economic rights necessary for the fair value of liberty, a right to work, a right to favorable conditions of work, a right to fair remuneration for one's work, equal opportunity, a right for rest, leisure, and reasonable limitation of working hours, the right to form trade unions and join the trade union of one's choice, a right to education, and an equal oppor educational opportunity, a right to take part in and benefit from cultural life. So social and economic rights uh, complement both negative and uh, positive liberty. All three kinds of rights are interconnected. Negative liberty, positive liberty, and social and economic rights are of no great logical distance from each other. Just as rights to negative and positive liberty are interconnected, so are social and economic rights. Without them, negative and positive liberty are vacuous. And without positive liberty, social and economic rights are threatened. Liberty, security, and subsistence are all basic rights necessary for each other and for and, and all other rights. They are inseparable. In summary, the contents of rights can be understood to include a right to negative liberty, entailing a basic right to security and freedom from coercion, a right to self-determination, entailing a right to civic and political participation, and a right to social and economic rights. That is a right to subsistence and uh, various kinds of equal opportunities. These rights constitute the substance of choices that can never be made or those that must be made in relation to human beings. In turn, rights entail duties. Every human right involves a correlative duty. Duty is the flip side of the rights coin. If there are rights, then there must be correlative duties. And duty pertains mainly to the state and society, but also individuals who compose it are obligated to each other as bearers of rights. Thus, the moral equation is not merely about what the individuals do as one who possesses dignity, but also and fundamentally, it involves what individuals are obligated to provide or refrain in relation to each other. Morality invi involves both what one is owed and what one owes. As Henry Hsu has demonstrated, rights entail three types of correlative duties. Duties to avoid depriving another the right, their rights. Duties to protect the other from deprivation of the right. And duties to aid the deprived. The primary duty of a state is, uh, excuse me, uh, the duty to avoid deprivation entails restraint, the obligation to refrain from destructive actions and or interference. The duty to protect entails the responsibility for the establishment of norms, social practices, and institutions that endure, enforce the duty to avoid deprivation. The duty to aid is positive in the sense that it is on, uh, it is an obligation to provide for those in need. Furthermore, human rights are moral claim, as Thomas Pogge has suggested, human rights are moral claims upon the organizational 
organization of society, in particular the state. It is the primary duty of the state of government to aid, avoid depriving, and protect the human rights of its citizens. Therefore, the state has a basic responsibility to protect. If a sovereign national government commits or allows clear and significant violations of the human rights of its own citizens, committing crimes against humanity, then its claim to sovereignty is no longer legitimate, for it has invalidated the social contract by violating its primary responsibility to protect its citizens. In conclusion, we have outlined and discussed the basic ideas and elements of human rights. Human rights constitute the principles of an ethic of human dignity. Human rights can be understood as basic principles of justice that exist in reflective equilibrium with the elements of fairness and our basic moral convictions. Our human rights to negative liberty, political self-determination, and the economic, social, and cultural resources necessary for the fair establishment of both negative and positive liberty are essential for an ethic of human dignity to exist and flourish. These human rights are important tools for the empowerment of citizens, not only in relation to state power, but also because they are instrumental in establishing spheres of peace and the continuing pursuit of human rights and peace within that corridor. Furthermore, human rights as justified claims and protections entail duties of justice. These duties and the rights they are grounded in are urgent matters of justice and are the subject of various theories of justice to which we will turn in the next lecture.